Another type of burn that we can have is an electrical burn. And electrical burns tend to come from one of two sources. We could have a lightning strike, or we could have uh, energy coming from sort of a man-made source, and that's usually somebody has touched an outlet in a wall, or somebody was working on a piece of machinery that they hadn't fully um, locked and tagged out, so then it was energized, and they <clears throat> they got shocked through that. A uh, few terms to understand with uh, with electrical burns. Um, <clears throat> one is voltage, and voltage is just the amount of electrons flowing from one area to another. They always flow from an area of high concentration of electrons to low concentration. And the greater the difference between those two is called the voltage. Now how fast they go from one side to the other here is the current. And we measure that in a term called amps or amperes. Now as things flow or as these electrons flow through something, if there's a greater flow of electrons than the material can handle, there's some resistance. Uh, and everything has some version of resistance. Copper is probably one of the lowest resistance substances out there, and that's why we use it for our wiring. Um, skin has a pretty variable resistance. If it's fairly dry and fairly thick and calloused, it can it can really, really be resistant to electricity. If it's more of a wet or moist area, like maybe the palms of your hands or in and around your mouth, the resistance isn't as great, and the energy can flow a little bit easier. And that's why. Um, you'll see kids that, that bite down on electrical cords or something, their burns around their mouth tend to look pretty severe. And then we have all this physics -y stuff, uh, which if you're an electrical engineer, I'm sure you would know this, this term very well. Uh, but power, the amount of, of energy in essence that, that's happening is due to a measure of current and then resistance and time. And what we get out of this is that the more time somebody has been in contact with the energy, the more power they're going to have, which means the damage is going to be worse. Now, for electricity to hurt us, we have to have an electrical source enter the body. It then flows through the body, and it almost always goes to ground. So they may touch something on the on the wall, or they may bump a high power line with an elbow, and then the energy would flow through them down to the ground. How does this affect the body? Well, for starters, you're going to have an entrance wound, um, and this is typically fairly small, and it's going to be a burn. So you, you, usually second, third degree type burns, but fairly small where the energy entered, and then it traveled through the body and exited it. And again, that's usually down near the ground. And this exit wound can almost be explosive. It can blow its way through the, the foot or the boot in this case. So you may have a very large wound here. Um, oftentimes there's a little bleeding, but not a lot because it coagulates stuff. It, it cauterizes it. Uh, then coagulated, it cauterizes it. Uh, energy always, or electricity always wants to travel the path of least resistance. And your body has two areas that have less resistance, and those are your cardiovascular system and your nervous system. Uh, so unfortunately, as this electricity travels through the cardiovascular system, it can either destroy blood vessels, which can cause some internal bleeding, or it can cauterize them, which then causes areas to not get blood flow and become ischemic. It can also travel through this nervous system, and this can cause things like seizures in a patient, but it also can travel through the nervous system of the heart and then put them into ventricular fibrillation. Uh, the good news is that the heart is generally in good shape when this happens, and if we can defibrillate it fairly quickly, uh, they, they should come around. It also, um, going through again the cardiovascular system, the blood vessels and the nerves, it can cause some significant muscular contractions. And all patients that have had a significant electrocution should go ahead and be um, stabilized on a board to try to splint as many of the, the bones as possible because they can cause, or the electricity can cause such significant muscle contraction that it actually snap their bones. And we see this um, not a lot, but occasionally, rarely with uh, spinal cord injuries. Uh, so to make sure we stabilize our patients, splint them the best we can. Uh, respiratory system, one of the things that happens, and this is, um, pretty common with electrical strikes actually, is that it uh, stops the diaphragm and stops their breathing. Again, uh, once we get to them, if we can get bagging them fairly quickly, this is usually reversible. 
Uh, but CPR is, is real important for someone that's in a cardiac arrest or respiratory arrest due to electricity. Uh, just make sure they are not in contact with the energy anymore when you start touching them.